We are welcoming an incredible panel of some of the smartest people in journalism today thinking about web to to Web3 and tools that can be used for journalism. And so uh, on the stage, we have Bailey, we have who you heard about earlier, we have Charles uh, Sherry from Water and Music, we have Mike Masnick from Tector, and then we have Trevor who runs the Freedom of the Press Foundation. So welcome, everyone. All right. Is this mic on? Yes. OK, great. Um, I just wanted to take uh, a a little poll here. How many people are journalists in this room? Yes, love to see it. And even if you're like half and half, that still means you're a journalist. Anybody who writes things is good. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll do my intro first. I'm Bailey Reitzel. Some of you saw me on the last panel. Um, longtime crypto journalist. Started writing about it when it was just Bitcoin back in 2012 for a company called American Banker. Um, and then have uh, now written about crypto all across mainstream media and also all of the crypto publications. Um, and yeah, that's me. Uh, she said, best in journalism. She said it, I didn't say that, um, but I, I believe that. And then, okay, I'm gonna introduce my panel. So again, she kind of mentioned this. I'm joined today by Trevor Tim. He's the executive director of the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, Sherry Hu, founder and publisher at Water and Music, and Mike Masnick, founder and editor at TechDirt. So we're gonna talk about Web3 tools for journalists, and also I wanna talk about how journalists are covering Web3, so sort of like branching off that topic a little bit. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll start by, I just want a brief introduction from each of you about how you all are covering Web3 and what sort of hurdles or exciting pieces you found. I'll start with you. Sure, well, so first of all, thanks for having me and thanks to the Filecoin Foundation for putting this on. Hopefully people can hear me. Okay, seems to be working. Um, so. My name is Trevor Tim. I run um, an organization called Freedom of the Press Foundation. We're a nonprofit um, based in the US that uh, protects and defends journalism in the 21st century. Uh, a big way that we do that is through technology. And so, uh, you know, our, I think a, a good way of looking at this is, is uh, even a bit broader than, than Web3, just thinking about decentralization in general. And, how can decentralization help journalists? And so the big way we look at this is actually through journalist rights and press freedom. Um, so if we think about kind of the opposite of decentralization, the centralization of all of our communications mechanisms over the past um, 10 or 15 years, whether it's Google or Facebook or AT&T and Verizon, this has actually caused a reduction in the rights of journalists. So over the past 10 years, we've seen the Justice Department in the United States, for example, um, issue a record number of legal orders to uh, Google or other third party services to essentially spy on the communications of journalists and their sources. Um, this has happened across um, administrations, um, uh, Republican and Democrat. Um, there was several egregious examples at the end of the Trump administration where the Trump administration uh, got the communications records of, of New York Times journalists, of CNN journalists, of Washington Post journalists, but it also happened in the Obama administration. Uh, there was a notorious case involving the AP where they got 20 a the, the records of 20 AP phone lines um, without the AP knowing. And that's really where this comes into effect is um, when we're talking about press freedom rights, journalists need to have the ability to decide, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, if the government is trying to surveil me, I wanna be able to protest this in court. Well, when the government goes to Google and gets all this information in secret, often it's too late for journalists um, uh, to protest. So it might have been back in the 70s and 80s, journalists could say, actually, no, I'm gonna refuse to comply and I might even uh, go to jail uh, to protect my sources. Well, now they're not really given that chance anymore. Um, and so at Freedom of the Press Foundation, one of our biggest projects is called Secure Drop. Uh, it's essentially an open source whistleblower submission system. Um, so you may have heard of it. It's in about 70 or 80 news organizations worldwide, including a lot of the, the largest news organizations in the US, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Guardian. Um, and the idea behind it is to remove all of these third parties from the equation, remove the Googles, the AT&Ts, the Verizons, um, so that there is nothing in between the source and the journalist. 
So we build the Secure Drop software and system. We help news organizations install it. We train journalists how to use it. But once we help them install it, we are essentially locked out. It is a decentralized system. So every single news organization has their own instance of Secure Drop. And so it, you know, we can't stop the government from trying to spy on news organizations. Uh, but what we can do is, is force the government to say, OK, if you want to secretly collect journalist communications, you actually need to go to the news organization itself. Um, there is you know, nothing that we, as Freedom of the Press Foundation, can do if we were to ever receive a legal order of this kind. Um, and so I think that's a, a good starting point for talking about uh, kind of the decentralized web in general, is you know, how can Web3 or the decentralized web or just broader decentralized tools help journalists further how they do their work, whether it's protecting their rights, um, potentially helping find better business models. We know that uh, a, a lot of news organizations and, and especially local journalists are struggling or anything in between. Um, so, so that's kind of where, where we're coming from on this. How many newsrooms do, are using SecureDrop? Um, so we don't have an exact count. It's an open source project. And um, you can actually install it without our help. Um, but we think around 70 or 80 worldwide. And so it's also available in 20 different languages. Awesome. Um, and then Sherry, how are you thinking about Web3 for journalists? Um, yeah, this is so interesting to hear your perspective because it's like complimentary too, but definitely different from what I'm thinking about day to day. So I guess for context, my background is in business reporting. So, um, and, and specifically about the music and tech industries. So I got my start in 2015 um, covering anything under the music and tech umbrella. So uh, like music streaming, music startups, music and crypto um, for a lot of different publications as a freelancer. Now I run my own newsletter, Water and Music, uh, that's dedicated to those topics. Um, and so in terms of thinking about like how journalists are covering Web3 and what the technology adds from like a reporting perspective, two things come to mind. One is the ability to just follow the money um, in a way that is just not possible with um, any other industry, and maybe I'm like biased uh, by my experience in the music industry, where things are intentionally like obfuscated a lot of the time in terms of you know how um, music streaming royalty payments flow, like who owns what percentage of uh, you know what song, like that is still um, that information is still so siloed. Whereas you know once you have a uh, you know contract address for like an NFT, you can kind of follow the life cycle of the NFT or of like a fungible token in like a much more transparent way. And there are really cool data analytics tools that are out there now like Dune, uh, some people here may be familiar with where um, it's like totally open and free for you to just uh, query any part of like the Ethereum blockchain, for example, and be able to like build your own dashboards to track uh, like how certain DAOs are doing in terms of their token price, token activity, et cetera. So that's one area in terms of like the financial transparency that um, Web3 enables for journalists, and then financial accountability. Um, second thing I'm thinking about uh, is not about finance at all. It's just about perception. Uh, I think we're still at a point where uh, if like we asked everyone in the room to define Web3, we'd get like 50 different definitions. Like there isn't a shared understanding of what like Web3 really is. Um, I've had this experience, uh, so like Water Music is also in the process of becoming a DAO because we have a collaborative research model behind the reports and articles that we publish and I found that like no one agrees on what a DAO is. And um, there are yeah, so many different definitions and like major metro publications like the New York Times especially are like starting to cover DAOs a lot more and um, in many cases like putting a certain layer of perception on what DAOs are that I think could like really influence, like the power of words to impact our understanding of technology. I mean, this is not new to any journalist in the room, but it's like especially true with something so nascent as DAOs. Like tons of articles have come out now just calling DAOs like uh, Discord groups with a shared bank account or like internet forums, the shared bank account. And it's a very specific like cultural framing of DAOs, which is fascinating to me. Also can be like, very limiting in terms of understanding, you know, the potential of the technology. So that is like top of mind for me all the time, just seeing as like DAOs and tokens are covered more, like um, the certain perception that is like put onto them by uh, media publications. 
Yeah, that's really fair. I mean, even Bitcoin, which has been around the longest, right, in terms of this cryptocurrency community that we're in, uh, I think there's still folks who don't know how to define that because the narratives have shifted so much. Uh, and that, that's fine. It's a nascent technology, which doesn't have a leader to sort of move it in one direction or another. You know, it was a payments technology. Now it's more of a store of value. It can be both, right? But so those narratives shift all the time. And I think that's particularly challenging um, in this fast paced environment of crypto for journalists to stay ahead of when, you know, they're also covering stuff that is maybe not just crypto. Um, but Mike, want to pass it over to you um, to give a little introduction about how you're thinking about Web3. Yeah. Uh, and again, thanks to everyone for coming and thanks to Filecoin for putting this on. This is um, should be a really interesting discussion. Um, I come at this from, from a whole bunch of different angles, and I've been sitting here listening to everybody trying to figure out which, which one I want to discuss. All of them. So, yeah, that's tricky. Um, so, you know, so TechDirt started in 1997. We're about to hit 25 years. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and, you know, so I've lived through a whole bunch of different uh, changes to the internet, uh, and, and the, the original goal of TechDirt was really to look at this intersection of innovation and business and law slash policy, uh, though I didn't know that when I started. <laughs> I think it was more the, the innovation and business side and then the law and policy side just became more and more important to that. Um, and so I, I've seen all of these things change and all of these sort of revolutions sort of come and go and some of them were accurately predicted, many of them were not accurately predicted and so we would see all of these different things and, and sort of the one sort of through line that I kept seeing is the, the question of adapting, right? The, the world is changing so quickly and whether or not, you know, companies, uh, entrepreneurs, um, you know, individuals are able to sort of make the shift from, from one platform to another or one system to another, sort of how well they're able to understand it and to adapt to it and, and change um, or not in, in lots of cases. And a lot of the, the sort of failed organizations that we've seen are ones who haven't figured out how to, to adapt. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is specifically to the news business um, is how much the news business itself and journalism has struggled over the last 20 years. Um, and the way that it has been treated is often sort of lashing out at this or that entrant or technology. So, you know, I, I don't know how many, how long, lots of people here are journalists. I don't know how long people have been in journalism in the room, but like there was this period in sort of the mid 2000s that Craigslist was to blame for all evils that happened to journalism. Uh, and that, you know, Craigslist was a problem. There was talk about how Craigslist had to be shut down to save journalism. That didn't quite work. Then for a really long time, it was Google that was the problem that destroyed journalism. And then more recently, it was sort of Facebook that destroyed journalism. I haven't seen any TikTok has destroyed journalism, but I'm sure that's coming as well. Um, you know, there's this, this sense of kind of fear without sort of understanding where, you know, what to do about it. And, and so that's often taken the form of kind of lashing out at whatever company or organization is successful. And the thing that I find really interesting about all of this, and I've argued this, you know, going back, I don't know if it's exactly 25 years, but there are probably some of the articles in the early days. To me, the, 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 the really interesting thing about journalism and the really important thing about journalism is that it was always a community building business. And I think a lot of journalists say that it's actually a, a news business um, and they're not so interested in the community. But I think if you look at the success of early newspapers, it was because they had they were the, the one source of kind of local community. That's where the local community would get their news, it was where they would get their information. And the business model was then having that local community and effectively selling the attention of that local community to local advertisers. Um, and I think somewhere along the line, the, the, a lot of people in the news business, for better or for worse, sort of insisted that they were in the news business so much that they forgot they were in the community business. And many of the things that have happened over the last 15 to 20 years has really been to, you know, push away the community. Um, and this is at a time when you had the internet rise up, where the internet enabled so much more communities to form that didn't exist before. So where before you, people would sort of default to the local newspaper as their sort of, you know, 
center of you know center of gravity for local communities now suddenly had all these other options and instead of sort of recognizing that and trying to build more around community what a lot of newspapers did was push people away and they would put up paywalls and lock up the content or you know uh, a lot of newspapers early on had comments, but then the comments became a disaster area because nobody wanted to actually invest in making comment sections good and reasonable, and so then they would shut that down. And again, every, every aspect of this was shutting down community, which struck me as doing the exact opposite of what you should do if, the, if you recognize the journalism business is a community business. So that's a, a long way around of saying the thing that I find most interesting about sort of what's happening in, in Web3, and especially with things like DAOs, NFTs to, to a certain extent, is that it's an opportunity to bring the community aspect back into journalism that I think is lacking, and I think is one of the reasons why so many journalism organizations have struggled over the last you know, few years. Um, and on top of that, the potential to then separate out some of the journalistic activities from certain, you know, rather large platforms, the same ones that, they're, that journalists are claiming are killing, that they also, you know, rely on day to day to, to exist, the ability to sort of separate themselves from those platforms and build things on their own and have more control and more autonomy, um, I think is a really exciting part of, of the Web3 space. Yeah, that's a really interesting frame because I do think I would say usually I'm in the news business instead of the community business. So I really like that. You also make me realize that journalists are a bunch of whiners, like so much. So um, stop that. Anyway, um, okay, well, so on your point, in terms of, I guess one of the spaces where I see a bunch of community being built in crypto is Discord. Um, I don't know if you have examples of news communities that are using Discord appropriately. I do not follow any of them. Um, I do. Okay, I great. can speak to that. Yes, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess also for context about how water music has evolved. So um, primar to this day, it is primarily a quote unquote web to paid membership model. So um, I started on Patreon, um, just as like a solo newsletter writer focused on music and tech in 2019. Um, decided did not foresee at all how much Discord would explode just as like a social platform. Um, but uh, I just saw Discord had a direct integration with Patreon. I was like, uh, and from the beginning, I did um, know just like following the media industry, actually following like the music industry, which has inspired a lot of how I've structured my thinking around media is that the community around a publication is, can be as much a source of value as like the content itself, especially in a world where um, information arguably travels freely. You know, people can tell people about information um, behind a paywalled article. And so um, it, it is to an extent a commodity. And so, you know, what can you build around that that doesn't, uh, d doesn't like dilute the uh, importance of that information per se, but just like, like just from a business standpoint, you know, um, make sure that you're not just putting all your eggs in one basket. So I've always, from the beginning, thought about building a community outlet for like-minded readers of my newsletter um, because also it's like very niche like the the group of people who like are interested in tracking like music tech trends is like niche but super tight-knit and so like creating a space for that that I didn't see exist elsewhere in addition to publishing articles and so I hosted on discord um, I it definitely is a lot of work as I don't know how many people here like have communities around their like publications but it is a lot of work so have a community manager, community lead, who's like looking after the, the Discord server. I'm very active in their day to day, like just fostering a culture of like open, transparent communication, like with with readers as well. Um, and that said, Discord definitely is like uh, I guess at the end of the day, a gaming platform and not <laughs> a media or research platform. So we're definitely like definitely have growing pains, like as more and more people. Uh, I guess for a sense of scale, we have around 2,000 people in our Discord server now, and that's like getting to the point where it might make sense to like move off to something else. And that's something we're looking into now. But um, in terms of like early days of fostering that like real time communication and like direct, uh, like two way slash multi way access, you know, among readers and then between writers slash reporters and readers, it's been super effective. And I think has played a big role in, in where we are today. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I can talk to that too, because we also have a discord though. Um, we, we sort of, uh, came to that almost by accident where, you know, again, like I've always focused because of my belief in, in sort of community being the important part, I've always focused on community, but um, so we had actually set up very early on before Discord even existed, we had set up kind of a group chat 
uh, for supporters um, to to come in, but we had built it ourselves, which is you know both a blessing and a curse. We had full control over it, and we could do a lot of stuff. But also, we saw all these other you know entrants like Discord come on the market and focus on that and build much better tools than we were ever going to be able to build ourselves. Um, the one thing that that we did, and then so so we just. Sometime last year, I forget exactly how long ago, we, we moved that community over to Discord. But one of the things that we really wanted to do that we had had in our original community was there is an aspect of the community that is public and an aspect that is private. So some of the discussions are then mirrored on our site. So you can go to our site right now and you can see a view of, of the discussion that is public. You can't join that unless you support it. There are different, you know, support levels, and there's a certain support level you get into the, now into the Discord. Uh, before that, I was into the community, but we have part of that discussion public and part of it is private, so we can have that kind of discussion. We had to build then a tool to translate uh, a, a Discord channel onto the website, which we thought would exist, but it turned out it didn't, didn't quite exist. But it, it has been a really valuable tool. Um, the, the, I mean, the chat we had before it, but the Discord as well has been a really valuable tool for sort of keeping the community engaged, keeping people involved, um, and, you know, honestly for hearing what people in the community are really interested in, what they think we should be covering, um, talking to us about different, different potential stories, telling us when they think we got something wrong, um, which I value. I know not all journalists always like that, um, but I found it, you know, a, a really great learning experience. And it's one of those things that, beyond the the aspect of just sort of having that community there, it also uh, enables a more direct connection between our our community and our audience than the way that a lot of news organizations, uh, like uh, you know, a lot of news organizations really focus on like the social media hits and. You know, getting getting a story to go viral on Facebook or whatever, um, and to me, I don't like that's nice when that happens, but I don't care that much about it because those people tend not to come back. You might get some of them to come back, and that's great, but I'm always you know focused on what 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 can I do to have a loyal audience who comes back directly because they want to, you know, they want to be there, they want to support us. Um, you know, every, you know I, I actually don't track very many statistics, unlike lots of journalists. I, I don't track that many statistics in terms of like how much traffic we get. But the one thing I do track is how, uh, how much of our audience is coming direct versus coming from some other source. And I always want it to be as high as possible. So, you know, if we ever get to the point where like more than 50% of our traffic is coming from other sources, that worries me because I don't think they're, they're particularly loyal. And one of the things that we've noticed with building the community and the chat and then now the Discord is how much that gets people to just come back to take part on the site directly rather than like just following us through Twitter links or Facebook links instead. And so that aspect of building that kind of loyalty um, has been really, really valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the issues is that journalists are, are typically asked to do a lot, um, and, and they're pretty strapped, right, for time, for money, yada, yada. It's like, first, you know, I went to school to, to be a print journalist, and then they were like, well, you have to also be on air, and you also have to have a podcast, um, and so, and now we also have to manage a Discord. And so I think, you know, a lot of that is just, it, it's very challenging, and it wasn't, it definitely wasn't taught to me in school. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of schools now who are sort of teaching this transmedia integration. Um, but Trevor, I wanted to pass it over to you in terms of how you were educating journalists about using secure, tr secure drop and what that looked like. You know, were the journalists relatively tech savvy? Um, what were some of the questions that came up over and over again? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and you know, to be clear, like uh, secure drop is not a tool which I think anybody would call Web three, uh, but it is a decentralized tool in the sense that everybody is running their own secure drop. And you know, we're trying to solve two pretty difficult problems at the same time. Number one, how do we better protect journalists from legal orders um, that would essentially surveil their sources um, and their own communications? But then number two, how do we prevent journalists from being hacked at the same time? You know, it's, it's a, it, in the, the traditional world of, of uh, cybersecurity or digital security, you know, the advice is if you receive an attachment from a stranger being emailed to you, 
you know, be very wary of opening it and probably don't open it at all. Yet, you know, with secure drop, journalists are saying, please, strangers, send us attachments, we'll open them right away. And, you know, so we have to build in a bunch of protections on the back end to protect journalists from malware. Um, and so what that ends up meaning is that it is relatively easy for sources to use SecureDrop. Um, it, they actually have to rely on another decentralized technology, uh, the Tor browser. Um, but basically, uh, beyond that, it's just like opening a, a, a more secure contact form on any news website. But so we have to teach journalists uh, to jump through um, a few hoops to, to protect themselves um, on the back end from receiving uh, malicious files from people who may be trying to attack the news organization. And so um, it is a learning curve for journalists, which is why we'll actually go to news organizations and, and, and um, uh, teach them how to use it. But it's also on our end, we're starting to invest more in kind of user research. So we actually go to news organizations now and um, uh, sit with them for half a day, try to watch them use SecureDrop in, in a way that we're not seeing what they're actually doing um, as far as the, the content of their communications. Um, but figuring out, you know, which buttons are confusing and which instructions are confusing. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a very um, kind of um, apt lesson for Web3 in general. And, you know, uh, Mike was just talking about how, you know, when he was, uh, you know, essentially uh, hosting everything himself and building everything himself, um, there is a lot of baggage and friction with that. We have to, re we, I think we all have to remember, despite the fact that probably everybody in this room does not like Google and does not, and does not like Facebook, we have to really internalize why do people go to Facebook and Google, and it's because it ma they make the experience very frictionless and easy. And if, if we are going to kind of create a, a new web where literally billions of people go, um, it can't just be for a theoretical reason or for even for the reasons that I work for every day that, you know, this is going to strengthen um, uh, your rights as, a, as an online citizen. Um, we have to make the on-ramp as, um, as, as seamless as possible for them and be inviting rather than, than uh, you know, potentially daunting. Um, and, you know, what, what I worry about is that, uh, you know, as more and more people get involved in Web3, are we just transitioning to a system where there are other centralized giants than the ones that we don't like now? Um, it, you know, so it, like 10 years into cryptocurrency, for example, like the on-ramp to cryptocurrency, um, if you want to do it in truly a decentralized way where you're not using um, you know, any large companies is, is very, very hard. The easiest way into, into crypto is to set up a Coinbase account, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar corporation. Um, and so, you know, I think um, these are the types of things that we all have to be thinking about is, as we try to teach people more about Web3 um, and, and invite them onto the platform and, and figure out like how can, how can Web3 be useful to you rather than, than the other way around. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, I, I think that's a really good point. And, and one of the things, and this goes back to sort of watching all of the you know, different past kind of revolutions is that you know, when, when there's something new that comes up, sort of the first instinct of the people building it is to recreate the, the last thing and to, you know, to rebuild it. So now we're seeing all these attempts to sort of like, you know, can we build a, a crypto version of Twitter or, or Facebook or, or whatever? Um, and I think, you know, that, that's a natural instinct and everyone does it. And I think it's part of the kind of the learning experience of sort of new platforms. But the really interesting things don't really happen. And the, the real, you know, explosion of adoption doesn't really happen until you build the things that, you know, that work for that, that system. You know, so I'm, I'm still sort of waiting for the, the amazing sort of crypto experience that takes the, the nature of crypto and, and makes it, you know, like core to, to the way the, the thing is, is acting as opposed to just sort of trying to rebuild the old thing. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good point. And, and a, a good example of this is actually, um, and so this isn't decentralized, but it, I, I think it, it um, gets to the point uh, really well. Um, Signal Messenger, uh, you know, basically, 
the gold standard in secure messaging. Um, it's all end-to-end -end encrypted by default. Um, it's really easy to use. They store very little um, metadata. Um, we recommend it to journalists um, in all sorts of situations, and even uh, you know, just it's it's become the thing that I message on more than than any other app. Um, but Moxie Marlin Spike, the founder of of Signal, um, talked very often about the fact that um, you know he was he wasn't looking to to necessarily. Um, create a secure messenger. I mean, he, he certainly was, that was his goal, but his ultimate goal was to build the best messenger for people to use on a daily basis so that they never ever had to even think about security. Like th that he wanted people ultimately to be choosing it um, because it was the easiest to use and not the hardest to use. And this is a, a, a huge problem in, in digital security in general. Oftentimes, the more secure something is, the harder it is to use. And the easier it is to use, the, the less secure it is. Um, and so with Signal, he, he tried and has, has su generally succeeded in doing both. There's, a, there's over 100 million users of Signal now. Yeah, I think like one of the jumping off points there that I want to get to is just, you know, we saw like people doing decentralized Twitter, you had Steam, and I think there were a couple other sort of like blogging, social media platforms, crypto platforms. And what I saw there, so this sort of segues into the new models for revenue for journalists or bloggers, um, and also about sort of recreating basically the old structures that we already have is like on Steam, a lot of what you could find there, it was pretty niche, right? And it was pretty crypto focused. So like if you wanted, by building the infrastructure on crypto, that meant that most of the journalists there, sorry I keep using air quotes, it's just like, you know, I don't know, they're maybe not journalists per se, sorry. Um, but it was just very crypto heavy. And a lot of it was, the, again, why I'm using air quotes is because a lot of it was very pumpy to specific cryptocurrencies that they wanted to pump or shill. Um, and so I guess, you know, that, that was not a question, but just more like, how do, we, how do we figure out where to go from there when in the funding models for journalists, when by building on these platforms, you basically create a different type of echo chamber? That, that question ended in a different spot than okay, I thought. Sorry. sorry, but that's well, okay. Pick whatever no, spot you no, that's good. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think there. I, I think. I think that's natural, right? That's always going to happen, right? You're going to attract the people who are, who are sort of already primed to be interested in that kind of space. So I think that's natural. But then what will start to come out of that is is sort of further experimentation. And so, like you know, one of the platforms that like that I've experimented a little bit with and I'm, I'm planning to do more is a platform called Mirror, which I think. Yep. So, people are probably somewhat familiar with, which sort of started as, I don't know, kind of a cross between Medium and Patreon slash Kickstarter. It was sort of like, a, it wanted to be kind of a blogging platform, but with a, a funding model built into it. Um, but they've been really innovating very quickly and iterating really quickly and sort of learning like, how can we build in other features that are really, really useful to it? Um, I don't know that they've hit on like the perfect model yet, but I've been just really impressed with all of the different like little things that they've added a, as they've gone. So, you know, um, you know, we we did an experiment with them. Um, in basically, I just did a crowdfunding project through Mirror to work to write a paper. Uh, about the NFT space and kind of trying to understand the NFT space and what does it really mean. Um, and I'm I've still been doing the research on the paper, the paper won't be out for a few more months. Um, but like even in the planning of that, to the point that we launched it, the, the Mirror folks had a added a whole bunch of really interesting features in terms of like adding a competitive element to the, to the crowdfunding, which was, was different and, and kind of neat. And they added this, the, uh, a thing that I don't understand why no other crowdfunding platform has done was like a, uh, what they called the podium feature, which was basically like if you were the, the largest funder, you in, in this case, you would get a special NFT, um, but you would basically get this sort of bragging rights associated with whatever it was that you were funding, and you create this, this really interesting and different kind of model. So I, th I think that we're at this point where everybody is still 
testing and iterating and trying out different things and some stuff works for, for some areas and, and if you look at Mirror now, like yes, like a lot of the early stuff was kind of about crypto, but you're seeing all different other kinds of things start to show up as well. And you're seeing like fiction writers are, are taking to it. You're seeing, you know, other kinds of publications are using Mirror. And so I think that, you know, part of the way that we get through that is just by allowing the experimentation and sort of uh, you know, um, and having, a, in, in the case of Mirror at least, a platform that's really responsive to trying to figure out different ways to, to change and to adjust to, to what the community is actually using. And I think that, you know, we'll get there eventually as, as people start to experiment, rather than, you know, coming up with like, you, you, basically you, you can't think through all of the different ways ahead of time, right? Yeah, yeah, it's fair. Sherry, I want you to piggyback off that because I think you're experimenting with NFTs and you were talking about DAOs, like how have you um, uh, expanded your funding model and then what kinds of challenges have you seen in launching that to your readership? For sure, yes, so um, I guess as a specific example, so uh, we have been experimenting with like this collaborative research model where, so we now have almost 2,000 people in our community um, and a small but very like passionate and loyal uh, group of those, um, sorry, group within that community is also interested in getting involved with our reporting and our research, um, especially on a topic like music and Web3 and where that's going, where information is so um, fragmented and noisy that it actually makes sense, at least in my view, to have a more crowdsourced approach to that where people can help us like, curate projects, interview communities that might um, otherwise be overlooked by like mainstream media especially. So um, we put out two of these reports so far, one in December and one actually uh, just last week. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to self-promote too much, but you can go to stream.waterandmusic.com to like see the full report um, just for context. Um, so there are like five different chapters and there were, uh, the first season had around 50 contributors and the um, this uh, latest season has over 90, like all coming from the community, helping to produce these very long form reports on various aspects of music and Web3 from um, like how are all these music NFT marketplaces trying to like uh, adopt basically the same users and try to compete for the same users. So doing a lot of like research into that, a lot of research into like fan sentiment, music industry sentiment around Web3. Um, those are just some examples of the topics that we cover. And for both of the reports, um, we uh, also launched uh, these lifetime membership NFTs. So we worked with a designer in our community to design the like covers for each um, thread of the report, each chapter of the report. Kind of that is, I guess, more standard to you know traditional media publications from a branding standpoint. But those covers also each became their own NFTs, and anyone who bought them, um, we priced them at point. Uh, 0.2 ETH for the first report, 0.3 ETH for the second one. Um, and it would give you lifetime membership to Water Music. Like, very simple, uh, hopefully simple, understandable utility to um, people, especially who have been following Water Music for a long time. Um, and that uh, was super successful in like helping to raise funds, uh, all of which, and speaking of like accountability and following the money, you can like look at the contract address uh, or you can look you know, on the Ethereum blockchain to see you know, where all those NFT sales were funneled to and how they were distributed uh, among all of our contributors. And so just um, continuing the ethos now like in a much more transparent on-chain way that we've tried to promote the very, from the very beginning, which is like financial, not just financial, but cultural transparency, like being able to work directly with like reporting and research teams as well. Um, and yeah, so now we have like a crypto treasury that is, um, again, very new, but like growing quickly um, alongside the Web2 membership model, which is still driving most of the business side. Nice. Okay. And that's, it's like a nice segue. I know maybe you guys are looking at this and being like, what am I looking at up here? So I just, I, I wanted to talk through this because you were saying like, hopefully this is easy, right? Hopefully this NFT launch is easy. And what I find is it, it can be, right? And I'm pretty crypto native, obviously. So I find these things maybe simpler than the person walking on the street who is just here for the music. And so like, I just kind of wanted to go through this process because this highlights both the kinds of information that journalists can glean from understanding the blockchain and what we're looking at and all of the data that flows through that, um, but also sort of the hurdles. So this is just Etherscan. Um, the reason that I stumbled upon this is because there um, is this, I think this is known, so I, I don't think this, you know, you don't have to tweet this as an exclusive, but there's a vulnerability in the sand token contract if you don't know what that is it doesn't really matter but it's a gaming uh, gaming NFTs platform 
Um, and it means that when users, users can accidentally send tokens into the SAN token contract. Um, and that means they are lost. They do not come back out. But the exploit has allowed, um, you know, an exploiter to funnel those funds that are sent to the contract into their own wallet. Um, and a, a guy that works at Immunify, a triager that works at Immunify, saw this process and decided to be a Robin Hood. So he decided to create a bot that would catch those funds before the exploiter's funds, and then he sends them back to the user. And okay, so two different points here. The, you have to know how to use this and to, to understand what you're looking at to be able to find this. But these are those transactions. I clicked on one of these transactions here, and so this is the, these are those transaction details. You can go over here, so this is like overview logs, doesn't matter. You can go to the comments, um, and this ether scan will have two comments on it, I believe. And I actually don't know what these say, so sorry if they have like, uh, okay, yeah. So this is just folks talking about these recovered funds um, and uh, bro lost funds recovery available at WhatsApp. That honestly might be a scammer, not sure. Andrew is not the triager. Um, and so you can just sort of go through these and see different comments. The, the slight problem here is that what I wanted to show you was not these random people talking about these transactions, but was the triager himself, who's acting as the Robin Hood, somewhere in this transaction, he has put a note to the, um, he has put a note to the people he's sending his funds back, and it says, you know, you sent this to the contract, welcome to the dark forest, the dark forest, yeah. You probably know what the dark forest is, but welcome to the dark forest. Please be careful, right? Um, and the users maybe are seeing this and maybe aren't, but I can't remember how to find it. And so that's like my point is that this is actually really hard to use. Etherscan can kind of be gnarly to use, but I, I guess I want to talk about how we educate journalists in terms of understanding blockchain data, where they can find some of this data, you know, how they use that in their reporting. Um, Trevor, I don't know if this is something that like you've heard some of your journalists talk about or you've had to help educate as well, but um, maybe I'll, I'll dump it to you first. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. I think that uh, a lot of times, especially on Twitter, which fosters, you know, the most negative discourse possible in both directions, um, it, you know, the Web3 community and journalists kind of talk past each other. Um, and there is, there is not a, uh, you know, there, there are not, there's not enough work being done um, to, number one, help journalists better understand how they can use the blockchain in their reporting and how this can actually be an effective way um, for them to uh, cover, cover cryptocurrencies or Web3 or NFTs, which they all have to cover now. Um, and then, it, you know, I, it, this, this also goes both directions. Um, you know, I think that journalists can also do a better job of, of not necessarily thinking that everything involved in cryptocurrencies or NFTs um, is a scam or fraud, um, but kind of look at the whole picture. Um, but at the, you know, at the same time, I think it's important for the Web3 community to understand that journalists are supposed to be skeptical by nature, like that is their job. Um, and so if journalists approach you from a, a skeptical uh, point of view, this is actually a good thing. First of all, it hones the arguments of Web3 supporters so they can know um, exactly why people um, that might be skeptical of um, what they're doing um, uh, to figure out better solutions. Um, and it, ultimately, both folks in the Web3 camp and journalists can, can help each other and further each other's missions um, rather than necessarily kind of being, uh, you know, very adversarial towards each other. 
Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, I think like when somebody comes to you in a skeptical way, like the idea is sort of, you sort of get defensive and then you sort of lash out, you know, nobody, nobody wants to hear that they're wrong, but it does help you sort of fine tune your, um, your conviction and also the way that you describe um, NFTs or Web3 or whatever. Um, Sherry, I'm going to pass it to you um, in terms of, y you were talking about how you can use this blockchain data to do some of your reporting. So maybe you can give us an example of a success you've had there and then also something that you've learned in terms of like looking through these streams of data. Um, for sure. So yeah, very concrete ongoing research project at Water Music that um, we have been working on for the last like year, roughly year and a half, is just a database of um, music NFT sales data. Um, for now, we're only tracking um, primary sales data, but we definitely want to incorporate secondary sales data, collector data, but just getting like contract addresses for each of these NFTs and being able to see you know, how much they sold you know, initially. I see in the context, again, of like the music industry specifically, I see that as a success and a really interesting starting point for like more investigative work because you literally cannot do that with any other part of the music industry like it, or it, it can it'll be very difficult i think to do that without going through a ton of like investigative political loopholes like if i wanted to get um i guess there are these like trade reports on like you know annual music streaming revenue or like these companies will like self-report you know, how much money they made from like tickets or merch, but the data landscape compared to Web3 is just so opaque. So um, yeah, so that's an area that uh, I would consider a success in that we are able to put like a proper price tag on it, which is uh, I think around $83 million in music NFT sales for the last year. So for like 2021, like even being able to say that and like point to the data on chain is like, I think a huge accomplishment from a business reporting perspective. So uh, very excited to see like where that goes. Yeah. yeah. In the future. And then in terms of that number though, I guess where the opacity, that is a success. I am not knocking that at all, but I, in terms of where the opacity is, it's just like, you can't tell who those people are. Who For sure. Are yes. Funding that. Yeah. I completely agree. And I think this is also where um, maybe like culture. So, so much of like the web three journalist clash is like fundamentally cultural and in web three, I guess in general with Web3, what's really interesting is that you're seeing all these different like political ideologies like all going on chain at the same time and like battling for attention or for like control in a weird way of this decentralized technology where the whole point is no control. I bring that up because there is, uh, I guess the, the idea of anonymity is very polarizing, I think, in Web3. Like there are people who, especially with like more cultural uh, DAOs, like music related DAOs, I think there is the importance of like recognizing people's identities and like realizing that that's like an important part of like being part of a community where it's like human to human connection. Whereas there's a whole other world where the whole point is that your identity doesn't matter and you can kind of operate in this world anonymously. And I think um, something that I thought was just like par for the course and I saw it, I was like, oh cool, it was like when the Bored Ape founders were doxxed I'm glad when you brought they, that up. Yeah. I was going to bring it up. Yeah, when they were like revealed, and it's like, oh, cool, we know them now. Like, it, 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 I guess from the journalist side, it wasn't like shocking to me, but it drew so much backlash from that yeah. part of um, Web3, like followers of that project, because they're like, no, the whole point is that like they should still be able to make all this money and uh, still be able to operate like without being known. So I think that there's no like easy solution to that, but to your point, it's like, yeah, journalists are always going to be skeptical and are always going to try to, like, find that basic information about, like, who we're talking about. Yeah, I wanted to bring up the Board Ape Yacht Club uh, founders getting doxxed only because I can see it, I can see it sort of both ways, right? Journalists are supposed to do this kind of investig investigatory stuff, you know, they're supposed to look into the lives of people who make lots of money, who are very powerful, but on the same side, I like read through that article and was just like, why did we do this? Like, the, the founders hadn't done anything wrong, right? And so it just felt like we were doxing them to be like, haha, we can do this. Um, I, so, yeah, so I saw it both ways. I saw like a yeah. skeptical look from tech to, from Mike over there. So yeah, so, yeah I'd yeah, love to hear me, what you think. That's a, it's an interesting point. I'm going to push back a little bit on it. I think part of it is just sort of like the, the, the uh, changing definition of doxing even and, and what is doxing. Yeah, exactly. and, and like, um, you know, I think historically the, the original concept of doxing was sort of like, you know, revealing private information about someone, including things like their home address or, or s 
things that would normally be and, and regularly kept private for good reasons to, to protect them or, you know, or, or, or whatever. Whereas in this case, you know, this was a company that was trying to raise money at a multi-billion dollar valuation. Um, that's the kind of thing that in most other normal circumstances, the identities of the, of the individuals, just letting you know there's time running out. Got but, it. Uh, <laughs> um, in, you know, most other cases, the, the, the individuals behind such a company are publicly known. And in this case, it wasn't even that anything uh, particularly nefarious was done in order to get their identities. They had effectively not really covered their tracks very well and, and left that open. So I thought that was a, a perfectly normal and standard journalistic practice in terms of identifying them. And I like... I had this discussion with a whole bunch of people on Twitter because, you know, where you have very safe and sane conversations on Twitter. Um, you know, it, there is this sort of disconnect between, like, I, I think some people in the, in the community, in the Web3 community, who sort of feel like because they're setting their own rules on, on certain aspects of it, they get to reach out and set the, their, those same rules for other aspects of it. And that's come down in other interesting ways, too, especially in relation to, to journalism, where you have people in that community who rightly, I think, and correctly talk about the empowering nature of Web3 technologies to enable more freedom of speech, to enable more people to speak out who otherwise might not be able to, and I think that's great, but those very same people, when a journalist covers them in a way that they find negative, suddenly freak out threatened to sue, you know, or in some cases actually do sue, and there have been a number of lawsuits from people from these communities trying to silence journalism because it's critical of them. I, I think that's a little bit hypocritical <laughs> sure. to say that you support free speech and then you try and suppress the, you know, journalists who are, you know, who are covering you legitimately. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I, I, Trevor, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, I'm beyond that I completely agree. I mean, let, let's think about this from a different perspective, too. Like, if there was a multi-billion dollar oil company or if there was a multi-billion dollar chemical company, um, would we say that no, actually it's off limits for journalists to figure out who is running these companies? Like, that would sound crazy. And so, you know, I think we still have to apply the same standards um, it, you know, across the board, uh, whether we're talking about an oil company or 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 uh, a, a Web three company, it's it, you know the the amount of of power that these people could potentially wield in the future uh, means that you know it's important for journalists to to be able to do their job. And and, and let me just add, like I think there is something really interesting about the fact that you know Board Ape Yacht Club and and the you know the company behind it was able to stay you know, pseudonymous for as long as they were able to. And I think that's, that's interesting, but the idea that that became like a, a, a right that they had to keep that, their identity secret, I don't think is true. You know, I, and so th there is this fine line. I think the, the part that you're struggling with is like, you found that, that part interesting, right? The ability that they were able to create this company and nobody knew who they were. And the fact that you see other kinds of DAOs or other kinds of new organizations popping up where the identities aren't known, depending on the community, whether or not that, that is appreciated, is something that I think is really interesting and powerful about, about DAOs, and also potentially really useful in the journalism space where you do want to have trusted sources, but those sources also need to protect their identities. Yeah. There, there, there are a lot of different competing forces here. But, but the nature of that, I still think, was just you know standard garden variety journalism. This is an important company. They're raising a lot of money. Their identity matters. Yeah, I mean, that, these are all fair points. And like I said, I can see it both ways. I guess because I've been, you know, most of my career has been in crypto journalism. And so I'm just very used to calling people by pseudonyms. And unless they, t unless they prove to me that they shouldn't be, that they should be fully, you know, their first and last name, in my mind, like, let them be, right? Um, and, it, be, but I guess that goes... It's a little bit of a hard line because like if I know somebody by both their first and last name and their pseudonym, then that means like I'm harboring that first and last name information and not releasing it publicly just because I don't think the public needs to know, but that puts like a weird pressure on me as the journalist like keeping that as well. Yeah, no, I, I think that that is an interesting struggle. I think it, 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 everything is context dependent, right? You have to sort of understand like if that matters to the story and in the, in the case of the BuzzFeed article that, that revealed them, I think that, that was kind of the key point of it. You know, 
know, I think there are lots of stories that don't need that, and it depends on what kind of story you're trying to tell. Sure. But I think that the, the nature and the context of this story was, you know, was just standard journalism. Yeah, so I want to, so, <laughs> so we'll stop arguing about this now, uh, <laughs> um, but I want to turn, uh, we only have a few more minutes, but I sort of want to turn to other Web3, decentralized web, crypto tools that you think could be very valuable to journalists. Um, so, you know, I was on the panel with Bruce Sirkail and some others about the decentralized web and decentralized storage like IPFS and Filecoin. In my mind, I think that's pretty powerful in terms of um, collecting the stories of journalists and making sure that they persist over time, hopefully, so that we can start learning um, from our history, although humans don't appear to be very good at that. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to, I'll start with you, Trevor. Just are there these decentralized web technologies that you think journalists should be looking at a bit more? Well, it, you know, I think Web3 is in its very nascent stages. And, you know, there's, a, there's a, a lot of promising projects going on. I mean, look at what uh, Starling Labs is doing with um, kind of chain of custody of, of photographs to try to help uh, try to mitigate misinformation or disinformation. Um, but ultimately, I think these tools that will ultimately help journalists the most have yet to be built. Um, or um, things that kind of exist on Web 2.0 um, transitioning to Web 3.0 to become more resilient. I mean, I think the Internet Archive is is um, the, the most you know amazing tool that is available to journalists um, in the history of the Internet. I mean, uh, how many times has um, uh, you know journalists in this room used the Wayback Machine um, uh, to to find a a page that they that no longer exists? I mean, um, you know they're incredible collection of um, uh, television clips, which somehow no, not, not a lot of people seem to know about, but it, it's the most amazing tool that you could possibly use if you're looking to figure out, you know, what was on television and, and how can I use it in my reporting. Um, and, uh, you know, make it the Internet Archive for, through various um, actors over the years has come under threat. And if the decentralized web can make the Internet Archive more resilient, despite the fact that this is a tool that exists today, um, I, I think that's a huge win for journalism because we know that it will be around or, or is more, much more likely to be around in, in 10 years, 25 years, 50 years from now um, uh, than it is today. Yeah, absolutely. And Brewster had mentioned that the life uh life cycle of a web page is 100 days, which I thought was incredible. Like, surely none of you really knew that unless you just happened to know that stat. 100 days is not many days for a website. Um, so anyway, Sherry, I'll pass that same question to you. Um, yes, there are, uh, I guess there are multiple different angles I'm thinking about this. Also, not just like reporting on Web3, but like running a hybrid Web2, Web3 company. So I guess those are like yep. the buckets. So in terms of like financial analytics and transparency, I mentioned Dune analytics. If people, it requires a bit of technical knowledge of um, SQL specifically, but if you're if you're familiar with that, um, it allows you to just like directly query Ethereum and build your own dashboards on any like tokens you want to follow, both fungible, non fungible, any DAOs, um, kind of as an extension of that as well. So, recommend that. Um, Graph Protocol is another um, up and coming like analytics tool, also built on Ethereum. That's one bucket. On the, um, oh, I, I, and I guess an emer still very early but emerging area of, um, I guess, platforms on top of NFTs, if that's what you're interested in following, is just having more um, just like context on collectors, especially. So there's an app called, uh, it's literally called Context, context.app. It allows you to follow specific collectors over time. So if that's an area of interest for anyone here, like if you want to follow some of the top like music wow. NFT collectors, you can uh, get their contract address, plug it into this app, and then it'll have like a feed for you, a uh, personalized feed. And then in the hybrid Web 2, Web 3, uh, like ops world, I use Mirror a lot. Um, they're definitely like the top uh, Web 3 native like publishing and um, crowdfunding and financing tool. Um, we dropped, we minted and sold our NFTs on Mirror, still are. Um, Coinvise is um, super easy to use tool um, if people are interested in minting their own um, social tokens or like fungible tokens, not NFTs. Super, super easy to use interface. Um, Coinvise. Coinvise. Coin V-I-S-E. Yeah. Um, and um, 
I guess like Gnosis is, I, I don't know how familiar people are with these tools already, but like if you're interested in starting a DAO, um, a Gnosis safe allows you to have like multiple signers on a wallet if you're interested in going down that route. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Before I pass it to you, Mike, the journalists that are in the room, are we all familiar with Gnosis, Coinbase, Dune Analytics, just by show of hands? Okay. Yeah, 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 great, perfect. Um, so I'm just gonna do like a very short plug of something that is not actually out in the world, but um, so ACJR is Association of Crypto Journalists and Researchers. Um, I am a part of that group, like a ton of us are a part of that group. But one thing I want to do is start sessions for journalists that are like, here's how you look at an NFT contract. Here's how you look at Etherscan and basically take journalists through um, how to start reporting on these using the data that's available. Um, so they have a Telegram and also probably a Discord. I, I can't remember. I'm just on their Telegram. I'm happy to send that to you. If you guys are interested in those kinds of sessions, then we'll get those we'll get those worked up. But um, Mike, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll repeat what what just sort of reemphasize what 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 uh, both the other panelists had to say, and just add to that the one thing that I think is is potentially really useful about Web3 for journalists is the fact that so much so much of journalism is under threat today and that there are attacks and, and we can talk about you know attacks on the internet archive and and hopefully they will be able to survive uh, but you know that it's also true of lots of journalism organizations um, you know uh, I know lots of people get legal threats. I've been sued a few times, uh, unfortunately. I hope that no one else ever has to go through that experience. But they do, and some of those lawsuits lead to, to sites shutting down. And there's a project that I know Freedom of the Press Foundation has worked on helping to archive uh, news organizations that have shut down. And so the idea of having Web3 related things to be able to archive that for in, in perpetuity, I think, is a really, really useful tool. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. This was super, uh, super interesting. Thank you all for being here. Yep.